In this video, I review the health benefits of millets, including its potential impact on diabetes. Check it out. Millets are highly nutritious, but vastly ignored as a main source of food, primarily due to lack of awareness. You've heard of ancient grains. Millets ain't messing around, arguably the first grains cultivated by humankind, not just dating back 5,000 years, but maybe 10,000 years. Why the plural millets? Talk about lack of awareness. I had no idea that millet wasn't the name of a specific grain. Millet is just a generic term that doesn't just apply to a bunch of different species, but to a bunch of totally different plants. There are so-called major and minor millets. There's pearl millet, which is what I think most people think of as millet, but then there's proso, foxtail, and finger millets, which are all completely different grains. They look similar, but they're not the same. Fiber is one of the main things we're looking for in a whole grain, and kodo millet is like off the charts. But compared to other grains, finger and foxtail millet also beat out the bunch, though note that what most people think of as millet is really on the low side. But looking at the polyphenol content, even plain millet beats out the other grains, including sorghum, which I you know, previously hyped for its polyphenol content. But again, kodo millet seems to win the day. Total antioxidant-wise, though, kodo and finger millet are comparably high. Nutrition-wise, finger millet is said to have eight times more calcium than other grains, but looks to me like uh, more like 10 times more, just off the charts, three times as much calcium as milk. Uh, some of the millets are exceptionally high in iron as well. Regular millet is high, but barnyard millet has like five times more iron than steak. OK, so nutritious, but what about specific potential health benefits? In the medical literature, you'll read things like this. Millets may prevent cardiovascular disease by reducing triglycerides in hyperlipidemic rats. Who cares, other than perhaps pet owners, whether a food reduces cardiovascular disease in rodents? There was that epidemiological study in China that found lower esophageal cancer mortality rates in areas that ate more millet and sorghum compared to corn and wheat, but that may have been more due to avoiding a contaminating carcinogenic fungus than from benefit in the millet itself. Studies show millets may be effective against cancer cell proliferation in a petri dish, uh, with kodo and proso millet rapidly inhibiting cancer cell growth compared to pearl or foxtail millet, knocking down the growth of cancer cells but leaving normal cells alone, reducing the growth of colon cancer cells, as well as human breast cancer and human liver cancer cells, potentially also helping to prevent metastases by inhibiting cancer cell migration. My patients are neither pets nor petri dishes, though, and to date there have been no clinical cancer trials with millet. Are there any unique health-promoting attributes? Uh, finger millet is supposedly known for its health benefits, such as blood sugar lowering, cholesterol lowering, and anti-ulcer characteristics. But the anti-ulcer study they cite just noted that some of the areas with a low incidence of ulcers also happen to be eating millet. But that's far from establishing cause and effect. And the cholesterol lowering study they cite, it explores what happens when you take tail tendons from rats and soak them in sugar and millet. What? But the blood sugar lowering benefits are legit. Apart from the fact that millets don't contain gluten, which is good for the 1 or 2% of people with celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, millets can also be exploited in the management of type 2 diabetes due to their blood sugar lowering properties. As reported by several studies on millets and millet-based foods in actual people, which we'll cover next. How does millet come to the help of diabetics? A substantial portion of the starch in millet is resistant starch, meaning resistant to digestion in our small intestine, so providing a bounty for the good bugs in our colon. Here's how the various millets do, all way more than more 
common grains like rice or wheat, but proso and kodo millet lead the pack. Uh, what's going on? The protein matrix in millet not only acts as a physical barrier, but actually also partially sequesters your starch-munching enzyme, and the millet polyphenols can also act as starch blockers in and of themselves. Millet also has markedly slower stomach emptying times than other starchy foods. If you eat you know, white rice, boiled potatoes, or pasta, your stomach um, takes about an hour to digest it before starting to slowly dump it into your intestines, and you know, two or three hours to empty about halfway. Whereas you eat sorghum or millet, and stomach emptying doesn't even start until two or three hours. It may take five hours to empty even halfway. Note this was for both a thick millet porridge or for just like millet couscous. So uh, since the non-viscous millet couscous meal was also equally slow in emptying, this suggests there may just be something about millet itself that helps slow stomach emptying, which should blunt the blood sugar spike, but you don't know until you put it to the test. And indeed, Millet caused about a 20% lower surge in blood sugar than the same amount of carbs in the form of rice. Remember how excited I was to show you how it only took the body like you know, half the insulin to handle sorghum compared to a grain like corn? Well, millet did even better. Give a group of pre-diabetics only about three quarters of a cup of millet a day, and within six weeks their insulin resistance dropped so much their pre-diabetic fasting blood sugars turned into non-pre-diabetic blood sugars. This so-called self-controlled clinical trial, the same subjects before and after, that's just a sneaky way of saying an uncontrolled trial. There was no control group that didn't add the millet or added something else, and we know just being in a study under scrutiny can cause people to eat better in other ways. So we don't know what role, if any, the millet itself played. What we need is a randomized controlled crossover trial where the same people eat both a millet-containing and non-millet-containing diet and see which works better. And here we go, a randomized crossover study having hundreds of patients, both do an American Diabetes Association type diet with or without uh, about one and a third cup of millet every day. And the millet-based diet lowered hemoglobin A1C levels, meaning an improvement in long-term blood sugar control along with some side benefits like lowering cholesterol. The target for good blood sugar control recommended by the American Diabetes Association is an A1C less than 7. Now They started out at an 8.37, but after a few months on millet, dropped to an average of 6.77. Is it just because they lost weight or something? No, suggesting that it was an effect specific to the millet. But they didn't just give millet. They mixed the millet with split black lentils and spices. And we know from dozens of randomized controlled experimental trials in people with and without diabetes that the consumption of pulses, meaning beans, split peas, chickpeas, or lentils, can improve long-term measures of blood sugar control like A1C levels. So while the researchers conclude that millets have the potential for a protective role in the management of diabetes, a more accurate conclusion might be a mix of millet and lentils can be protective, though, hey, maybe the spices help too. Uh, they didn't say which ones they used, and I couldn't get hold of the authors, but a similar study done by the, one of the same researchers included about a tablespoon a day of a mixture of fenugreek, coriander, cumin, and black pepper with a fifth spice, uh, perhaps a cinnamon or turmeric.